Hello, glad you're here tonight. We are going to talk about the so what of the resurrection of Jesus. We're going to talk about the doctrinal significance of the resurrection. Let's begin um, by prayer. Jesus, thank you so much that you are willing to leave heaven and come to earth and go into a, a weak, frail human body and suffer a lifelong and then, of course, go to the cross. We're so excited to learn tonight more about your resurrection because that's what makes everything count. Thank you again. Holy Spirit, be here. Speak through the internet. Speak here in this room and reveal him to us. Glory to yourself. Amen. All right, so we're page 614 in the big book, and we are used Dr. Wayne Crudum's Systematic Theology. And in the small book, it's page 115. <clears throat> we began on this last time, but I thought we'd back up a little bit because we kind of all can't really remember what we did this morning, so much less remember all. And so we've been making a case about the resurrection, and there's a significant part we skipped, but this, we're now getting to the so what, which is the really important reason why the resurrection. We've proved it really is, and, and Jesus really came back, he really was resurrected, and now we're going to spend our time on why it's important. Doctrinal, doctrinal significance of the resurrection. Jesus, a Christ's resurrection ensures our regeneration. What does regeneration mean? What does generate mean? What does re mean? Again, and generate is like life. So regeneration is to, to be redone, to be life again, regeneration. Peter says that we have been born anew, regeneration, by a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now when we mentioned this last time, I said when you're studying the word, when you're reading anything, certainly when you're listening to the talking heads or media, you have got to watch the little words because it's the definition of words and little words that make all the difference. You know, like how many times we've said, but God, that but changes everything. So it's the little words that make such a difference. So right here, what's the word here that connects resurrection to our new life? Through. Okay, so what does through mean? Our way up. It's the way, it's the vehicle that this happens. So we have a new life because of this vehicle that's coming. And this is the vehicle that God used to give us new life. So we have been born anew into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1.3 Here he explicitly connects Jesus' resurrection with our regeneration or new birth. So a lot of people focus on the new birth the birth of Christ, or the, our new birth, and they're forgetting it's all about the resurrection. And we're going to look at verses. If the resurrection ha wasn't what we interpret it to be here, then it would all be, we'd all be lost. So our new birth, we have living hope because of the resurrection. When Jesus rose from the dead, he had a new quality of life. So that's what glorified bodies are. If you want to describe it for someone, it's a new quality of life. A resurrection life in a human body and a human spirit that were perfectly suited for fellowship and, uh, fellowship and obedience to God forever. And that's where we will be one of these days. In his resurrection, Jesus, and we use the word here, purchased. We like that concept better. Jesus purchased for us a new life just like his. Now, we do not receive all of that resurrection life when we become Christians, for our bodies remain as they were, still subject to weakness, aging, and death. And so the phrase again that we use is already but not yet. That already we have everything, spiritually everything, is ours, but not yet. So there are some things, we get spiritual new life, but our sanctification, certainly our glorification, is not yet. So like Ephesians 1, we're seated in the heavenly realms with Christ, well, no one can claim they're actually sitting there that we talk to or read because they aren't there. It's the not yet. So this is that tension that we have, and um, we want to be careful of what we actually have and what we, the not yet is. 
We do not receive all of that new resurrection life, resurrection life when we become Christians, for our bodies remain as they were, still subject to weakness, aging, and death. But in our spirits, we're made alive with new resurrection power. Thus, it is through his resurrection that Christ earned for us, or purchased for us, I like that, the new kind of life we receive when we're born again. This is why Paul can say that God made us to, alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and, been, and raised us up with him. Ephesians 2, 5, and 6. Also, he says it in Colossians 3. Okay, raised us up with him. Are any of y'all seated right now in heaven? No. Anybody? No, we wouldn't be watching this. Okay, that's the not yet. So it is true and a reality, just not yet. When God raised Christ from the dead, he thought of us as somehow being raised with Christ, and therefore deserving the merits of Christ's resurrection. Paul says his goal in life is that I may know him, and that's intimate experiential knowledge, that I may intimately experientially know him and the power of his resurrection in Philippians 3.10. Paul knew that even in this life, the resurrection of Christ gave new power for Christian ministry and obedience to God. So you see, we need his grace and his power to be obedient. By being obedient, we don't get it. We can't ever get there if he doesn't do it. So the only way we'll be able to do it is because of that resurrection life. Because of grace, it gives us the power to obey. So... Your obedience is evidence that the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is in you. And that grace, because there's grace meaning favor, but grace is the power to do what God calls us to do. So grace is, the second definition of grace is the power, which we will call resurrection power. So the grace is power, and it's the same thing as resurrection power. Paul connects the resurrection of Christ with the spiritual power at work within us, when he tells the Ephesians, he's praying that they would know what is the immeasurable greatness, immeasurable. Immeasurable means what? It can't be measured because it's infinite. Only infinite things can't be measured. So this is the same thing as saying infinite. The infinite, immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe, right there, again, a very important word, where is this immeasurable great power? Yes. Okay, and now personalizing, it's where? In me. Because I believe, I cling to, trust, and rely on him. According to the working of his great might, which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him sit at the right hand in the heavenly places. So Jesus is really, really there. It says, in God's economy, we're there just like we're righteous. In God's economy and in his ledger, but not yet. Here Paul says that the power by which God raised Christ from the dead. Okay, so there's no, there's no equivalent to that. That's greater power than creating the world. Because when the Bible talks about power, resurrection power is at the top. Not creation, but resurrection power is at the top. So the Greatest power displayed or known of by God <clears throat> is the power by which he raised Christ from the dead. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and it's the same power at work within us. Within whom? Us. Uh -uh. Within me. me. Does it feel like that all the time? No. no. But it really is true. We have, this is the truth. Paul further sees us as raised in Christ when he says, You were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death. Is this talking about water baptism? Mm -mm. No. Is this talking about water baptism? Mm -mm. Is this talking about water baptism? Mm -mm. Everybody needs to say no to me. No, because no. 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 there's a lot of bad teaching and a lot of incorrect teaching that it's about water baptism. Water baptism has no more power than having a birthday party, spiritually speaking. But it's a fabulous picture, and it's an obedience. And so it's something very spiritual. But the baptism we're talking about here is not water baptism, because if you think of the thief on the cross, he went that day. He met Jesus, 
And within an hour, he was in, he was in paradise with Jesus. And he didn't get baptized. He, I don't even think he was a member of a church or anything. Okay? <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Be careful because the baptism, we, we think so much water baptism, which is important, but it's only an outward sign of what God's done in this. This is the picture of what we're reading here. Okay, let me back up again. When, when we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death, so God looks at Jesus and had us die with him. So that, as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So you, must, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus, which is the picture of water baptism. But that's what happened. God's saying, when Jesus died to sin and was resurrected, so were you. So that's applied to us, and that's the picture of water baptism. A question? We have a sweet little baby with us tonight. We hear some fun noises. <laughs> it's hard not to look up there and just grin and grin and grin. <laughs> this, is new this new resurrection power in us includes power to gain more and more victory over remaining sin in our life. Because continue, again, I hope some of you went home and read Romans 6, because Romans 6 explains us so well. Sin will no longer be, have dominion or reign as king over you. And it's the resurrection power that breaks that power, ongoing power of sin in your life. It's the resurrection power. Both 6, 4, 14 in Romans and 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Even though we'll never be perfect in this life, because it's the not yet, this resurrection power also includes power for ministry in the work of the kingdom. So this is, resurrection power is how we live the Christian life. It prevents, it gives us more victory over the remaining sin. It gives us power for ministry and the work of the kingdom. It was after Jesus' resurrection that he promised his disciples, you shall receive power and the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8. This new intensified power for proclaiming the gospel and working miracles and triumphing over the opposition of the enemy was given to the disciples after Christ's resurrection of the dead and was part of the new resurrection power that characterized their Christian lives. Okay, my question is, did you realize that this resurrection power, all of that power we talk about is resurrection power, referred to in Ephesians there and elsewhere? A question about it? If we did not have this resurrection power available, we would not be sanctified, we would not be able to have victory over sin, and we would ha not have the power to do our ministry in the kingdom. So basically this is describing the Holy Spirit. No, but I think maybe, probably we could say the Holy Spirit uses the resurrection power. That, that's maybe the fuel, because if we draw that connection, he's, the connection is the resurrection power, and it says you receive power from the Holy Spirit, so maybe the fuel that the Holy Spirit uses is resurrection power. Well, because it's just top tier. There's no more power God has available to us. Resurrection power is it for us. Anything else? But that there's more to the person of the Holy Spirit. Than yes, that that's spirit. what I'm saying. Okay. The Holy yes. Spirit is a person yeah. and all of that. But I think if we draw the connections with the scriptures here, that the power that he brings is the power of resurrection power that God promises to us. And so that's the power, that's the fuel, if you will, of what he uses. That there's not like Holy Spirit power, and resurrection power, but it appears, I agree with this, I think the two are the same. And that when he promises resurrection power, and he promises the Holy Spirit's going to bring you that power, it's the same thing. But it's not like wimpy power. It's the resurrection power that brought Jesus out of the tomb. So it doesn't get any better than that. Another thought or question? So unlike in the Old Testament, where many times 
we cannot apply promises to ourselves because they are specifically for Israel, for instance. This resurrection power we can apply to ourselves. Oh, yes. And I think it's the Holy Spirit that does it. Because if we look at what Jesus said in 1.8 of Acts, and then he says it's the resurrection power that empowers you to do these things, well, that's what the Holy Spirit's doing. Now, I know, and I might be, we might be separating something that shouldn't be separated or putting them together, but I wouldn't say, okay, I need to tap into resurrection power and I need to tap into the Holy Spirit. I don't think so. It's one and the same. But until I'd read this, I'd never realized, oh, that power of Acts 1-8 is the resurrection power. When we're talking about the power that brought Jesus back from the dead, he conquered death. And that's the power we have every single moment of our Christian life. And his power is perfected in your weakness. Amazing. So the resurrection power in the power of the Holy Spirit is perfected in your weakness because you depend on him which gives him free reign to start working. Pretty good. Remember, it just feels like weakness when you are living that 2 Corinthians 12, 9, you know, his power being perfected in weakness. The more you walk in that, I think the more you will see nothing but your weakness, which makes you dependent on him. Okay, another question or thought? All right, let's see what else. This is really important. Okay, so well, the main importance is with the resurrection, our first point, doctrinal significance is it ensures this new life and the power that comes with it to live the Christian life. Okay, <clears throat> not from ourselves, but from him. And the resurrection ensures our justification. We're going to look at some very specific verses about this aspect of Jesus' death did this, this aspect of this, and the resurrection, there's a little verse that shows you how important the resurrection is. In only one passage does Paul explicitly connect Christ's resurrection with our justification. Okay? Definition of justification, always know your shun words. Always defi define your words. Justification is the declaration that we're not guilty but righteous before God. It's a legal term. So justification is being declared right before God. And so it's very important, okay? Um, God, uh, Paul says <clears throat> that Jesus was put to death for our trespasses. So specifically, he died to pay the penalty. We've just spent weeks talking about um, being the propitiating sacrifice. He died to be that propitiating sacrifice to pay the penalty for, the, for, for sin. So that's why he had to die. He was put to death for our sins as a propitiation and raised for our justification. Philippian, uh, Romans 4.25. Uh -huh. So two different things. The death he died paid the penalty the resurrection provided our justification. When Christ was raised from the dead, it was God's declaration of approval of Christ's work of redemption. And since he said, yes, I accept that propitiating sacrifice, my daughters declared righteous before me and not guilty. But that's why the resurrection is important. This is the most important thing. We could flounder our way through life without resurrection power to live the Christian life. We would just flounder and flounder and flounder. We can't go to heaven without justification. So this is the important thing, is that it ensures our justification. It purchased or it declared our justification. What word does he actually say here? Raised for our justification. So it was uh, Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, 
even death on a, death on a cross, Philippians 2.8. God has highly exalted him, Philippians 2.9. By raising Christ from the dead, God the Father was in effect saying that he approved of Christ's work of suffering and dying for our sins, and that his work was completed, and Christ no longer had to need to remain dead. There was no penalty left to pay for sin, no more wrath of God to bear, no more guilt or liability for punishment. It had been completely paid for, and no guilt remained. In the resurrection, God was saying unto Christ, I approve of what you've done, and you've found favor in my sight. So see, the resurrection is huge. We just spent three weeks or more talking about all these aspects. Without the resurrection, it would not have been completed. The payment was completed, but it says it's the resurrection for our justification. God resurrected and said, done. So this is why the resurrection is so important. Do you have a question for me or a comment? Okay, let me read the next paragraph. Did I finish it? Okay, let me read that and then let's figure out, let's talk together and figure out, we've got to digest this. This is so important and a lot of times it's not taught. This explains how Paul can say that Christ was raised for our justification. Okay, again, that's in Romans 4.25. If God raised us up with him, Ephesians 2, 6, then by virtue of our union with Christ, God's declaration of approval of Christ is also his declaration of approval of us. When the Father, in essence, said to Christ, all the penalty of sins have been paid, and I find you not guilty but righteous in my sight, he was thereby making the declaration that will also apply to us once we trusted Christ for salvation. In this way, Christ's resurrection also gave final proof that he had earned our justification. So the package is complete. Okay, Christy, what was your question? Uh, well, I'm having a hard time with the difference of the penalty being paid at it is finished and justification being purchased at the point of resurrection. Well, it wasn't... Uh, purchased but declared by the resurrection. Let's see. Let's see, what is the word they use? Raised <laughs> for our justification, okay? The, what it was is the final approval to say, it is finished. Jesus said there's no more penalty to be paid. And this is the, what is it? Good housekeeping seal of approval. Okay, this is God saying, the entire history to the universe, the seen and unseen world, yes, okay, I receive this payment, it's finished, and my children will be justified because of this. So there's no more penalty to be paid. This is just the penalty is paid, and now he's saying, and this proves, because I've raised you from the dead, I have accepted it all. So we heard Jesus say it's finished, and he went to heaven, then this is the final chapter, B, if you will, on our salvation. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like an, an outward declaration for our visible state, for us. Yeah, to and put. in God's economy, it says he raised him for our justification. We had to, it showed his approval mm -hmm. on accepting the penalty, it's all finished, everything. It's done. A complete done deal. The penalty was finished, but this now says, yes, I accept it all, and from God's side, I guess, mm -hmm. to say it's finished. Yes. And therefore, we have the right to be justified, declared innocent, declared not guilty, because of the resurrection. Could you think of it maybe, <clears throat> and, you know, all examples break down, but somebody that has committed a crime, they go to jail. They're in jail for a certain amount of time, paying for that, then they get released. It's not the release that has paid for it, it's the time spent. So that time that it took for Christ to pay for the penalty, pay that, that the resurrection 
was like the stamp that said, okay, this is, this says, you're, yeah. you're let out now. From God's standpoint, yeah, from God's declaring standpoint. it to the world and saying, now, your children can be justified. It's a completed deal. It's all done. And so your children, Jesus, can be declared by Jesus. But we're not saying that there was any further work done in the tomb. No. The purpose of the tomb was to legally demonstrate this has been a valid death. This is not a joke. Right. This isn't magic. This really happened. Right. So it proved it really was a death. It wasn't just a falling asleep or being really tired or uh, going unconscious. So he really, really, really died and he proved it for all history. And then the Father resurrected him, saying, and this one verse lets us know this gave the validity to our justification. Because he says, I approve, I accept it, it's finished. Because the payment was finished at the cross, but the entire, if you will, we're not being disrespectful, but the whole package hadn't been finished. So after he'd proven he was completely dead, oh, broke the power of death. That helps so much because I was struggling with, well, it was, if it was finished, it was finished. It, it should have been done. So it was purchased, but this is the stamp that now you can take it and sh give it to your children. If you we might, you know, if there was no resurrection, <coughs> it might have been true that he paid for our sin, but if there was no resurrection, Okay, our sins are forgiven, but we but don't have life. Well, what about God? Yeah. What about life? That's this side of it. Yeah. And so now we've heard from him. As Romans 4.25 says, he raised him for our justification. Pretty important stuff. It, so isn't there a little... The scriptures say God raised him, or did he raise himself? Yes. So which is it? Yes. No. <laughs> That's what we stayed last time. I know, and I can't remember what. what yeah, there are two, there's scriptures that say Jesus is involved in the resurrection and God the Father. Most of them refer to the Father doing it, but there are other ones that we can look up that say, you know, so this is because he's God and not just a man. And that's as far as I can explain to you. <laughs> just like he oversaw his own creation in Mary's womb has to be true because of scripture because he his role as the son is to oversee creation and without him nothing is made that's made he is to oversee all creation of, and his body becoming nothing into a human being had to be overseen by God the son why was God the son in the human that was happening to conundrum those are the good words for conundrum that mess with your mind, but we can prove them biblically, we just can't explain them. Even with resurrection power, we are limited minds. It's like, you know, but it's amazing. Though these, that's the thing though, you don't want to talk it to someone who's not a confirmed believer, or they're immature in their belief, you never want to start with that. Start with the attributes of God, but have things that you can dialogue with them that they can grasp or be interested in, rather than the quirky hard stuff. If they go to the quirky hard stuff and go, well, that's a little confusing. I'm not even completely sure about how to explain all that, but let's talk about who God is. Or let's talk about what Jesus did on the cross. Let's talk about Philippians 2. Let's go look at these verses that you know. Hebrews 4.15. 4, all these things you do know, take them to what you know and talk about it there. But if you get to the minutia with someone that is just confused, it's sometimes easier to start back with ground them first and then go to the hard things. So you can go, I have no idea, I can't say anymore. <laughs> Just like I do. Because nobody can understand it. I mean, they do better than I, but they still, it's infinite. Right, so we've got our two reasons for the resurrection, why they're doctrinally important. The third, Christ's resurrection ensures we'll receive per perfect resurrection bodies as well. The New Testament several times connects Jesus' resurrection with our final bodily resurrection. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. 1 Corinthians 6.14 Similarly, 
He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. 2 Corinthians 4.14 but the most extensive discussion of the connection between Christ's resurrection, our own, is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 58. The most extensive talk about the resurrection anywhere is in 1 Corinthians 15. So anytime you want to begin with it or somebody asks you a question, always go to 1 Corinthians 15. That's where you're going to find more information than anywhere else, starting in verse 3. Um, Okay, so in 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 12, and see it's a long chapter, 58 verses here. There Paul says that Christ is the first fruits of those who fall asleep. In calling Christ the first fruits, and it's a parquet, I guess, Paul uses a metaphor, a picture from agriculture to indicate that, what we, that we will be like Christ. Just as the first fruits or the first taste of the ripening crop show what the rest of the harvest will be like for that crop, so Christ is the first fruits, as the first fruits show what our resurrection bodies will be like when in God's final harvest, he raises us up from the dead and brings us into his presence. So when you hear first fruits, it was a, uh, a feast and a celebration from the Old Testament. In fact, I think it's the week of, of Christ's death. I believe first fruits is that week. I'm not sure. Because remember, there's several Sabbaths. I'm not, I can't remember. But first fruits, they would have a thing at the beginning of the harvest, and they would, I mean, the, the, they would take it out and ceremonial taste it. Is the, are the grapes really ripe and delicious and luscious and so forth, or is it dried and has no flavor, you know, like you bite into an apple or just different fruits sometimes or even a lot of vegetables, you bite into it, it doesn't taste like anything, okay? And increasingly, more and more, it doesn't have much taste. But you bite into a really luscious strawberry or delicious whatever, you go, wow. And so in a spiritual sense, they're going, wow, this is the first fruits and we dedicate that to the Lord and then they dedicate the rest of it. But also, the idea of first fruits is you take the very first part of the harvest, which is a picture of what else is coming. So when he calls Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15 the first fruits of resurrection, he's saying he's the first and all of us are going to follow. So that's what first fruits means. Does, does that make sense? After Jesus' resurrection, he still had the nail prints in his hand and feet and the mark from the spear in his side in John 20. People sometimes wonder if that indicates that the scars of serious injuries that we have received in this life will also remain on our resurrection bodies. The answer is that we probably will not have any scars from injuries or wounds received in this life, but our bodies will be made perfect, incorruptible, and raised in glory. The scars from Jesus' crucifixion are, fiction are unique because they're an eternal reminder of his suffering and death for us. In fact, the fact that he retains those scars does not necessarily mean that we will retain ours. Rather, all will be healed and all will be perfect and whole. Hallelujah. Okay, so the ethical. Now we go to one more thing about the resurrection. Paul also sees that the resurrection has application to our obedience to God in this life. Without reading, could you guess what he's going to get ready to say? If I hadn't read it, I'd go, uh, I couldn't answer it. He sees the resurrection has application to our obedience to God in this life. I don't see how that, let's find out. After a long discussion of the resurrection, Paul concludes by encouraging his readers Therefore, remember we always look at the conjunctions and the small words. They're so important. Because of everything I've said in the previous 50-odd verses, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. That's uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It is because Christ was raised from the dead and we too shall be raised from the dead. 
that we should continue steadfastly in the Lord's work. So he's saying, believers, I've taught you all this about the resurrection. This is what's true. It's for our justification. If Christ isn't resurrected, our faith is in vain. He just goes on and waxes eloquently about it. And he says, because of that, because it's true, because we have this promise, let's stay steadfast. Let's hold to it. Let's work heartily for the Lord and bring him the glory. So he's connecting our obedience and our work in this life for him to the resurrection. This is because everything that we do to bring people into the kingdom and build them up will indeed have eternal significance because we shall all be raised on the day when Christ returns and we shall live with him forever. Second, Paul encourages us when we think about the resurrection to focus on our future heavenly reward as our goal. He sees the resurrection as a time when all the struggles of this life will be repaid. But if Christ has not been raised, and if there is no resurrection, then this is what Paul says. Your faith is futile. It's worthless. It's empty. It doesn't mean anything. And you're still in your sins. So the, it's incredibly important that we have the resurrection, what we were talking about a while ago. Because we have to be justified. And that has to happen. <clears throat> then those also have fallen asleep. Let's see. Okay, fall asleep means to have died. It doesn't mean go to sleep. Okay? Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. For in this life, if we have hoped, if only we have hoped in Christ, we have all men to be pitied. That's what he says how important the resurrection is. He's saying it's so important that poor Christians, if there were not a resurrection, because then the, there would be no justification. It would, would not be finished. And he's saying the resurrection is so so important. But because Christ has been raised, and because we've been raised with him, we are to seek for a heavenly reward and set our minds on things of heaven, just like we were saying. Now he's going, you've been resurrected. You have been justified. He's done it all. He's giving you that resurrection power. Now go for it. Look, one day we won't be in these crummy old bodies. Be glorious and we'll be resurrected. Work hard for the kingdom. If you have then been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Okay, have we been raised with Christ? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the if really is sense for us. For as believers, we have been raised with Christ. So we can chase that if to sense. And be careful, sometimes they use if in the, in the translation of scripture, and it really means sense. Because for us it really is true, there's no question. So let's change it. Since we have been raised with Christ, let us seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Let's set our minds on things that are above, not on the things that are of earth. Since we died and our life is hidden with Christ in God, since we died and our life is hidden with Christ in God, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. To so say, go for it. That's out of Colossians 3, 1 through 4. A third ethical application of the resurrection is the obligation to stop yielding to sin in our lives. When Paul says we're to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, by virtue of the re resurrection of Christ and his resurrection power with us, that's Romans 6, then he goes on immediately to say, let not sin reign, therefore reign as king in your mortal bodies. Do not yield your members to sin. And he does it on the basis of the resurrection and that we are resurrected in him already and not yet. The fact that we have this new resurrection power over the dominion of, domination of sin in our lives is used by Paul as a reason to exhort us not to sin anymore. Does it make sense? Okay. Then what I want you to do is we have just covered the resurrection here. We're going to stop the camera here in just a minute, and I want you at home to do the same thing. I want you to go back through this portion with your neighbors here and just kind of review over it to bring it together a little bit. Because when we work for several weeks, we kind of forget what we set up here, and so we just want to bring it together. So 
Excuse me. So what I want you to do is just take your book, go back to the beginning of chapter 4, and let's just go together reviewing over the resurrection, and then let's come together and talk. Okay? You at home, do the same thing. Back up to the beginning of chapter 4, and just review over what you've learned, put your thoughts together, and see if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. Hope you had a good time reviewing and kind of brought it together. Let's find out, ladies, what's something that you found important or you grasped that you didn't or a question you have or just something you want to go, wow, this is really neat. Because remember, we wrote the resurrection, we, wrote, we talked about everything you knew and it wasn't a whole lot. And then we just looked at the facts and we came up with many, 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 many facts just looking at the, the Gospels. And so now my question is, what's something or an interesting insight or anything to share with the rest of us? Or you don't have to talk at all. <laughs> well, to, the thing, one of the things that I that I thought about was just that that I mean the resurrect everything. Just I guess I didn't realize it, but it's the focal point. It's yes. and if without it, everything else just doesn't matter, not, not only the whole New Testament, but even the Old Testament and the promises in the Old Testament, but um, it's a complete violation of God himself if he had not resurrected Christ, because then that violates his eternal nature, and then that violates Jesus as the truth, because he said, I'm the resurrection and the life, and just so many other attributes of God that just, just are completely discounted and, and untrue if if he had not raised himself, if he was not, if he did not, because he wouldn't be eternal, you know, and just, just all these things. So um, it violates God's character if, if he had not raised himself. But then, I mean, just the whole already but not yet, and the, I mean, just having that eternal perspective and praying for that more and more so that I, I do live my life even though I'm, I'm, and, and I'm not seated in heaven, you know, physically right now, but living my life in such a way as that, and having that perspective like that, because then, that, then I, I'm, you know, stop yielding to sin. Well, if I think of, when I'm in heaven, I'm not going to be sinning, so why should I, why should I sin now, and, and, and having that perspective, even though it's not yet reality, and, and what am I going to be doing? Well, I'm going to be wanting to bring glory to God. I'm going to be wanting to know Jesus more. I'm going to be wanting to have intimacy with Him and with, with other other believers and fellowship and just having more and asking and praying for more and more of that perspective on walking through this life. Very good. Well said. You sound a lot like Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Excellent. What else? Anybody else? A good conversation. Is that going to share anything? Going to share something? <laughs> I just say just the whole thing, just what it means to us. Yeah. It's That's what I really, because I already believed it. And right. I didn't get to see the evidence and all that. But this, how important it is to yes. us. Until I had studied this, I didn't realize how important it is. And, and like Bobby said, if it's not true, nothing else. Yeah. Might as well just. Christ will not raise you. Of all men are to be the most pitied. Yeah. Yeah. What's the point of being yeah. crying? Yeah. Well, and then and, and that violates God's his his justness because then there's no consequences for for anything because there's no there's no you know there's 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 no, no resurrection then there's no heaven but then there's no eternal punishment so there's no consequences for any sin here on earth if there's not you know I mean, just, eternal. The problem is the it all breaks down, yes. mm -hmm. and you can't, you know, that would be true also if he hadn't on the cross. But the thing is, I don't think we all, although we celebrate the resurrection every single year and we appreciate it, I think um, so much our focus is on Friday, appropriately, but we forget what we're talking about here, how important the resurrection is, yeah. because it had to happen. Yeah. Anything well, else? The, it's I'm monopolizing the conversation. I'm sorry. It's just I mean, it's just like the converse. The, the 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 focal point is is that I mean the, the cross. I don't. We don't want to take anything away from that. But if we're going to say it is finished and that is that is closed, and so what our focus is is on the eternal and on the the eternal is the resurrection and its life and it's not it's not. Oh, 
oh well this from your past this is your sins whatever else it's it's on eyes on Jesus and eyes eyes on him means looking ahead and that is keeping our eyes heavenly. Therefore do not look so, therefore all the therefores that Paul said about the resurrection how we are to live a different life and our focus to be completely different because of the resurrection. But we couldn't even live that without the right crucifixion. I know. Yeah. I mean, that's we it's a package deal. Yeah. If yeah. we weren't, uh, if our sins weren't taken away, if we're resurrected with all our sins, then, mm -hmm. yeah. So I thought, you know, when we go we way, way back, a bunch of months ago, we started talking about the incarnation and Jesus being fully God, fully man, and we developed all this, we developed all this semester like this. You take any of it way, the whole house of cards would fall. It is every, every bit as important, and one thing builds on the next and the next, because if you took anything away from his dual nature, or anything about the propitiation, or just the atonement, anything, if we took it away from it, it wouldn't be perfect, and do, and be all that God planned for it to be. When did he plan for it all that? Before, Before the foundation of the world. There we go. I mean, that's what's so amazing. This is not plan B. What a God. Anything else? Okay, then I have a question for you. Oh, did you have a question? No. Nice. Okay. I have a question for you. Tell me everything you know about the Ascension and why it's important. It happened 40 days after the resurrection. Okay. Um, he said that if he didn't leave, then the Holy Spirit couldn't come. Because he said, when I'm gone, I'll send him. People saw it happen. Yeah. And uh, people were there. Mm. He said they've been praying for us. Yeah. Okay, so that's a benefit you're saying. Mm -hmm. But see, uh, we don't know too much about why the ascension is really important. Ascension comes from the word ascend, like to go up, like a uh, descend and the opposite ascend. So Philippians talks about Jesus descending to earth, and now we've got the opposite direction. Okay, so let's read in here. We'll continue it's just after what we finished on the resurrection, and let's see what we have, the ascension into heaven. And so our list of all we know <coughs> could fit in the very top corner of our whiteboard. <clears throat> Christ ascended to a place. After Jesus' resurrection, he was on earth, for 40 days, so keep that in mind, 40 days, Acts 1-3. Then he led them out to Bethlehem, just outside Jerusalem, and lifted up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, Luke 24-50. Also, Luke, who also wrote Acts, you know, Luke is just Luke 1 and Acts is Luke 2. So they're just all, it's his books. Okay, he had a sequel. And when he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood before them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Right, so there we have this much. It's going to say something. Something in my mind I was going to comment about it. I don't know if it was. Oh, I know. I tried to find a picture of the ascension to put when I posted on Facebook or to send out an email. And they're all the hokiest pictures <laughs> in the world. I had trouble. I could not find a legitimate one. They were hokey, hokey, mm -hmm. hokey. And going back to the 14th century, okay, or just even the one now. They're just so unrealistic looking. And then I don't like to use pictures of Jesus that make him look like he's a Caucasian, upper class American with really nice blonde hair and blue eyes. Okay, because he was mm -hmm. And so I couldn't really find too much. But again, this is a really weird thing. That suddenly, he, I just have always thought this is kind of the, one of the most unusual things in the Bible. That literally, he just started going, okay. 
So let's read about it. But it was, I couldn't find a picture that wasn't hokey. I found one that was sort of not hokey. These narratives describe an event that's clearly designed. Okay, so what can we look, let's look at these two. How many facts can we pull out of this? What can we find here? What facts can we find between the two Luke accounts? Start naming them for me. He was lifted up. He didn't just vanish. Okay. He didn't vanish. They physically saw him. What else? in a cloud. Clouds enveloped him. He's going to come back the same way. Said he's going to come clouds. back the same way. Two men came. Two, men. two men came. We presume that they're angels. Mm -hmm. They declared he was taken into heaven, so they didn't have to wonder where he ascended to. Good, good. Because he, he have appeared and disappeared, so they might have thought, oh, he's just disappearing again. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Or I mean, eventually he would ascend, and then he could go out of their eyesight, but then they wouldn't know necessarily where he ascended to. That he's not that he's in heaven. Yeah, so so they there declared he went to heaven. <clears throat> What do you think he said? Why are you standing looking up like that? I would be standing there looking <laughs> up like that. I think he's going, get busy, he's coming back. <laughs> you know? What are you talking for? He's gone. Go to work, he's coming back. Which is the same thing that he tells us now. Okay? Go to work, he's coming back. All right? These narratives describe an event that's clearly designed to show the disciples that Jesus went to a place. What does it declare the place to be? Heaven. Heaven. So he's not floating out there. He's not going to suddenly come through the walls or something. He's in a place. He did not suddenly disappear from them, never to be seen by them again, but gradually ascended as they were watching, and then a cloud, apparently the cloud of God's glory. Okay, this is called Shekinah. So when we see other places where there are clouds, like um, in the Old Testament, there are places the bright light, the, uh, like in the, in the wilderness, the tabernacle, the burning bush, Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, this light, the term they use for it is Shekinah glory. And so the Shekinah is the white light revealing God's presence or glory when you see it. And so... Most likely, these clouds weren't like the cumulonimbus that we have right up here. Instead, I don't know what they are. That's just the fun one to say. Cumulonimbus is really fun to say. But that probably this was more than that. This was a spiritual cloud of God's glory in taking his son back into heaven. Maybe like the transfiguration somewhat? Very transfiguration-like very transfiguration. But it doesn't say that Jesus was all, that Jesus yeah. had the Shekinah himself like he did. In, when he comes back he's gone. Right. Okay. It's going to be, let's see. He had a humble entry the first time and a pretty fantastic exit. But his coming back is going to be something else. Mm -hmm. put it all to shame. Okay, so Shekinah is what we would call that. It took him from their sight, but the angels immediately said that he would come back in the same way in which he had gone into heaven. The fact that Jesus had a resurrection body that was subject to spatial limitations. Remember, Jesus is one man in one body. What do we say? Fully God, fully man. He's one body. With two natures, fully God, fully, that's it. He's fully God, 100% God, 100% man in one body and will be forever. This is part of the forever. So he didn't lose his resurrection body. <clears throat> so he didn't dematerialize. He didn't do a Star Trek thing, okay, or any of that. He stayed his whole complete body. If someone probably had left at him and grabbed his foot, it would have felt, it would have felt like a foot. So this was a supernatural event. But he went in his physical resurrected body. Okay, so he's coming back in his physical resurrected body. Be different, but it will be the same thing. Remember, he's, the body is subject to spatial limitations. So when we get to heaven, when we see him, Jesus will only be in one place. He can make, him, he can make himself seen everywhere supernaturally, but the physical body of Jesus will always be in one place. But just like right now, his spirit is everywhere. 
but that body will still stay uh, a spatial, limited to spatial, spatial dimension. It could be at only one place at one time. Means that Jesus went somewhere when he ascended to heaven. So see, that proves because he keeps a physical body, he has to go somewhere. So it's just saying he, that body had to go somewhere, be somewhere, so it's actually a place. It's surprising that even some evangelical theologians hesitate to affirm that heaven is a place or that Jesus ascended to a definite location somewhere in the space-time universe. Okay, but not where if we could travel in space we would find him. Okay, he's not suggesting that. But it really is a place where his physical body really is. Where before, before the, well, before his incarnation, he didn't have to be in a physical place because he didn't have a limitation of being in one place at one time. And now forever he will. So that's what his argument is here. It's surprising that even to blah, 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 blah. Admittedly, we cannot now see where Jesus is. But that's not because he passed into some ethereal state of being, that he went back to being something else that has no location at all in the space-time universe. But rather, because our eyes are unable to see the unseen spiritual world that exists all around us. Okay, there are angels around us, but we simply cannot see them because our eyes don't have that capacity. <clears throat> Elijah was surrounded by an army of angels and chariots of fire, protecting him from the Syrians at Dothan. But Elisha's servant was not able to see those angels until God opened his eyes so that he could see things that existed in that spiritual dimension in 2 Kings. Similarly, when Stephen was dying, God gave Stephen a special ability to see the world that's now hidden from our eyes. For he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, Behold, I see heaven opening and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God in Acts 7, 55 and 56. Jesus himself said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you for. I would have told you. <clears throat> If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also, in John 14. Of course we cannot say exactly where heaven is. Scripture often, he has a whole thing on heaven, so this is just a little bit on heaven. Of course we cannot now say exactly where heaven is. Scripture often pictures people as ascending up to heaven, as Jesus did and Elisha did, or coming down for heaven, as the angels in Jacob's dream in Genesis 28 did. So we're justified in thinking of heaven as somewhere above the earth. Admittedly, the earth is round and it rotates. So where heaven is, we're simply unable to say more precisely. Scripture does not tell us. But the repeated emphasis is on the fact that Jesus went somewhere, just like Elijah did. They didn't just poof and become like ghosts or something. And the fact that the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven from God in Revelation 21 all indicate that there is clearly a localization of heaven in the space-time universe. We just don't know what that is. But it's something different than not. And it's something different than just space. I mean, spiritual existence. Like, God doesn't actually have a body or anything like that. It's, it's not just that there's something. It's very real, and it really exists. We just don't know exactly what that is. Those who do not believe in Scripture may scoff at such an idea and wonder how it can be so, just as the first Russian cosmonaut, cosmonaut who came back from space and declared he did not see God or heaven anywhere, but that simply points to the blindness of his eyes. <laughs> 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 Unseen, I've been there and then God's not there. 
Uh, it does not indicate that heaven does not exist in a certain place. In fact, the ascension of Jesus into heaven is designed to teach us that heaven does exist as a, as a place in the space-time universe. But it's not like Pluto. Is Pluto been made of, of a planet again? I think so. Or is it still? Is it? I think it got put back in the planet group. But Pluto is, is really, like, if we flew all around the universe, we wouldn't bump into heaven somewhere. So it's a different dimension, but it's real. We don't know where. We don't know how that works, because it's a different dimension than just this. Is that, because I know I've heard people talk, I don't mean to digress, about when Paul talks about the third heaven, and he, he had the vision in the third heaven, and first heaven I've heard explained is basically like the earth's atmosphere, the second heaven, or maybe that was the second half. I don't well, I think it's the, that they, most people that I've heard teaching is that this is the air up here yeah. is the first heaven, okay. and then space is the second heaven, and then the yes. third heaven is this other place that's not yes. either one of those. where we could see it right yeah. now. Yeah. Okay? Is it got you too confused, or has it helped? See some confusing looks. Ask me a question. Well, I was thinking, I guess my thinking's always kind of been wrong. So, you know, the, is it like in Daniel where they're talking about the war of the angels in the heaven, like it was happening, but it was, it's happening, but you can't see it kind yes. of thing? Is that kind of what we're talking about? Yes. Okay. And we don't know exactly what it, what it is. We don't have any idea if there are angels in this room because they haven't manifested themselves, but they could actually be here. And so it really is a real place. And remember, it's not just uh, non-spiritual bodies that are there. Jesus is there with his glorified body. So it's more real than just being existing like before the foundation of the world was very different from this. It's something different because, uh, and uh, just don't know. Just be so careful because there's such bad teaching where people draw many more conclusions or they quote someone who says they've been there. And, and just be very careful that you limit what we can say we know is true to scripture and then the rest can be good conjecture. Like I like Randy Alcorn's teaching on heaven, but there's a lot of bad conjecture or people who teach it as fact. And so we have to be, I mean, their conjecture as actual fact. We don't know. It's something like this, but we just don't know. Another question? So, do we know, are we, do we have our glorified bodies when we die, or not only when Christ comes back? When our bodies are resurrected, then we get our glorified body. Okay? So, okay. if someone is dead now, their body is not reunited with their, they, that will be in the, second, in the resurrection when bodies are re, reunited with spirit. So have we talked about, I can't remember, do, does our body, when we die, does our spirit go to heaven? Yes, our spirit immediately, Paul says, at some of the body present from the Lord. So we will be there in an instant, but we just won't have our glorified bodies yet. Okay, and I'm not at all an expert on this. I haven't studied it a lot, okay, but that I do believe. I know we're instantly with him, but we don't have our glorified bodies yet. Right? But we will. Won't it be wonderful to be free? I just think the amazing thing, the moment you open your eyes, we won't have actually eyes to open, whatever it is, I don't know what it is. Not only to be there, but for the first moment, like a baby that's inside of a womb, their whole system is non-worldly because they're not a, it's not a cardiopulmonary system, the same thing with their digestion, their eyes, all of it. None of it is. And that one <gasps> changes the whole system and how radically different it is from what it was before <gasps> happened. Think of that first. <gasps> we won't have any of the corruption of sin. No effect of sin. We don't have any idea. It would be like suddenly if we didn't have any effect of gravity, except we can simulate that here. But the same thing suddenly, if we didn't have any gravity, how radically different everything would be. There's nothing compared to our first moment 
and we have no effect of sound. Whew. It's going to be Then we get to see him. Uh, okay, so that's number one, is that it tells us that, what, that Jesus really resurrected to a I mean, ascended to a place. Christ received glory and honor that had not been his before as the God-man. So our whole, we, our study, we started out in Philippians 2 about he did not consider quality of the God something to be grasped, back in verse 6, I believe, but made himself nothing, and he came and took on the body, and we just, all this time, and now he made full circle to verse 9. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he received glory and honor and authority that had never been his before as one who was both God and man. Before Christ died, he prayed, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory which I had with you before the world was made, in John 17. In his sermon at Pentecost, so Pentecost is 50 days later, uh, Peter said that Jesus was exalted at the right hand of God, Acts 2. Acts 2. And Paul declared that God has highly exalted him, there we are in Philippians 2, 9, and that he was taken up in glory, 1 Timothy 3.16 and Hebrews 1.4. Christ is now in heaven with the angelic choirs, singing praise to him with the words, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing, <clears throat> Revelation 5.12. So this is when he is given the name, and all the things that happen in that Philippians verse to exalt him, that's, this is what happens. When he goes back, then he is exalted, being the God man. See how this makes just a complete circle where we started out talking about the God man and what it meant, and now here he is, the God man, ascended in the glory of all the things we spent this whole spring talking about that he had done. And this is the culmination here for Jesus to be exalted again. Question or thought? So he, okay, so he was exalted before he became a man here on earth. This is just the return of that? Because you, you read this and it could be interpreted two different ways. It's almost like saying he was not given, he was not honored before he came. Down well, here, not, he is being, uh, therefore, because he, became, he was willing to go, he did not consider quality God something to be mm -hmm. grasped but made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, being obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. And so in glory, he's going, Before, I want to get back to what it was like. I want to share glory. See, he hasn't been able to share glory with the Father. He gave up the right to be glorified when he came to earth. Now, could he share that before? He he should, yes. 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 That's, that's the beginning of Philippians when it said, yes. he, he did not consider the quality of God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. We spent a lot of weeks on that, saying he gave up the right to be glorified, and he gave up a few right to, exp as, a, in, as a, the God-man, omnipresence. He will never have omnipresence as the God-man. So he gave up the right to exhibit some of his attributes, and... Um, the right to be glorified the way he always has been. And so then, boom, verse 9 of Philippians 2 says, therefore, because of what he's done, God has highly exalted him. And so now he's returned, like he says in 17, oh, to go back to the glory we shared. And so he's sharing the glory. He's being glorified in a way he stepped out of that. All these months we've been talking about what he sacrificed for us, and therefore he has been highly exalted. So we have, the ascension takes him to the place where he gets that high exaltation again. So he was glorified before as God, but had not been glorified as the God, as man. The God man. Is what it and is. for what he's done in those verses there in Philippians, which yes. are the entire scope of his life. So he had never been exalted and glorified in the real sense at all, until he died and was ascended. And now he is exalted, the name above all names, and every knee shall bow. All of that happens, therefore, because of what he came and did. And of course, we can't take away from the glory of God, but this is a new way, a new realm of glorifying him. I mean, we, his church, 
will be glorifying him forever and ever for what he did in those verses in Philippians for us. It's almost like in the Old Testament, there was this, you know, idea, and okay, there's a Messiah and whatever else, and praise God for that, but now that he's come, and there's there's a face to the promise, and, and yes. everything is, is... Yes. So, but he gave up the right to be glorified. Yes. And so that's why he's going, oh, to be back and to be glorified again. But that always confused me, is that, you know how we talked about sometimes, is it the man God talking, or is it is God talking when they say that? Was that... Well, See, Jesus the man is aware of being dual natured. Okay. So he knows he's dual natured. He knows, obviously, look there in John 17, he knows the glory he shared with the Father. And he has missed it like we can't miss anything in this life. But because how does we're he finite. Know that? If, if how did the man know that? Because he's dual nature. So it's not like somehow there's a not like um, con conjoined twins. Uh -huh. He's not like conjoined twins where they're two separate but they're just connected. It's not, remember, two complete natures within him and he's aware that he's not glorified. He knows it. The God-man knows it. And he chose willingly to give it up for us. He did, he did not have those dual natures before. No. See, this is where we all started out. Remember, we just studied Christmas. We went, how cool is that? And we started on the Incarnation. So you only have like this much in the book to read. That's all. <laughs> but that see, this is amazing the way it's, we have walked our way through it. And we have just united the circle. Because the Incarnation is his giving up glory to come and do what he did in Philippians. And now we are at the Ascension, which takes him back. And he can take back the glory and the honor that he had before the found, before the incarnation. Do you think that that other nature that he got when he was conceived and born and everything was something he had to learn about then? I have no idea. It said he grew yeah. in wisdom and I mean he had to he had to learn and grow. I mean just like this little baby tonight. Jesus had to do it. that's it's yeah. part of the sacrifice just, yeah. that blows our mind. And what, was he omnipresent before? Absolutely. The incarnation. He's so he's given, Absolutely. And he's given that up. He, he, his physical body is given up. His deity is right. not. Right. So his divine nature has never quit being right. omnipresent. But the physical body, he is choosing to be forever limited in his physical body for us. That was something he took on, and that's part of the sacrifice that he gets the therefore he highly exalted. It's part of the sacrifice to be God forced into the limitation of non-omnipresence, mm -hmm. not complete omnipresence. Mm -hmm. This is why it took us all semester to work through this. Good, I see thinking. That's good. In your thinking, do you have another question or comment to make? I was just thinking about when we talked about how we don't have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, and that he even even the already but not yet that we're experiencing, he yes, experienced he, he that experienced that longing yes. for the being restored. Very to good. Mm -hmm. And also in the resurrection body, I mean, he modeled what it was like to be limited by a body and then long for that resurrection body. Amazing, huh? What a savior. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Excellent. More? Let's see. Let me see how much. Okay, because what we're actually going to be able to do is to finish this up tonight. Um, where were we? Okay, God to highly exalted, taken good. Jesus is now in heaven, the angelic choir. Okay. Then Jesus was seated at the right hand, and the big fancy word is called Jesus. Christ session is the big term for it, but don't worry about that. One specific aspect of Christ's ascension into heaven and receiving honor was the fact he sat down at the right hand of God. This is sometimes called his session. 
Um, the Old Testament predicted that the Messiah would sit on the right hand of God. Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. When Christ ascended back to heaven, he receives the fulfillment of that promise. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 1.3 This welcoming into God's pre pre the presence of God and sitting at God's right hand is a dramatic indication of the completion of Christ's work of redemption. Again, he sits down. Remember, the priest can't ever sit down no in the tabernacle. There are no chairs in the tabernacle. There's not a bench. There's nothing. So when Jesus sits down, it's the high priest saying, done. It's done. Just as a human being will sit down to the completion of a large task to enjoy the satisfaction of having accomplished it, so Jesus sat at the right hand of God, visibly demonstrating that his work of redemption was completed. In addition to showing the completion of Christ's work of redemption, the act of sitting at God's right hand is an indication that he received authority over the universe because of what the verse was um, that we read above. Um, Paul says that God raised him from the dead and made him sit at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that's named. That's Ephesians 1, 20 and 21. Similarly, he says that word a lot. And try to say similarly real quickly. <laughs> similarly, Peter says that Jesus has gone into the heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. 1 Peter 3.22 Paul also alludes in Psalm 1, 2, Psalm 110, 1, when he says that Christ must reign until he put, has put all his enemies under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15 again. One additional aspect of the authority that Christ received from the Father when he sat at his right hand was the authority to pour out the Holy Spirit on the church. Peter says on the day of Pentecost, being therefore, okay, therefore again is so important, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you see and hear. So it's just everything saying, it's done, it's done, it's done. And look at the things that are happening because it's done. The fact that Jesus now sits at the right hand of God in heaven does not mean that he's perpetually fixed there or that he's inactive. He, has also, he is also seen as standing at God's right hand when he stands up for Stephen and as walking among the seven golden, golden kids, lampstands in heaven in Revelation 2. Just as a human king sits on his royal throne at his accession to the kingship, but then engages in many other activities throughout each day, so Christ sat at the right hand of God as a dramatic evidence of the completion of his redemptive work and his reception of authority over the universe. But he certainly engaged in other activities in heaven as well. So if anyone says, well, why did he sit down? There's your answer. Dramatic evidence of the completion of his redemptive work like a high priest, and his reception of authority over the universe. So that's what his seating means. I think it's really amazing. I think when Stephen, he stood for Stephen because Jesus loves his martyrs so much in the church. And I think he stood to honor the first martyr. And that's what he did. Okay, does this make sense to you about why he's seated? It's cool because, it, I mean, to me it takes me back and the fact that this is... It's the whole, it's, it's finished, takes you back to Genesis where on the seventh day God rested. Yes. And it's like so he's Jesus resting, is resting from his work, but yet we know that God it hasn't been just inactive. inactive and just taking a nap Perfect. or whatever until everything is so over. So see, he's that's what's happening. This in the Bible wraps back up to what happened yes. at that end of the Bible. Sort of like it's a total package. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now the doctrinal significance for our lives. Just as the resurrection has profound implications for our lives, so Christ's ascension has significant implications for us. And if you paid me a million dollars off the top of my head, I could not have told you any of them. First, since we're united with Christ in every aspect of his work of redemption, Christ going to heaven foreshadows our future ascension to heaven with him. We who are alive who are left shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, 
and so we shall always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians uh, 4.17 The author of Hebrew wants us to run the race of life with the knowledge that we are following in Jesus' steps and will eventually arrive at the blessings of life in heaven that he is now enjoying. Let us run with perseverance the race is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, us, our redemption, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne in heaven. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And Jesus himself says, he will one take, oh, take us to be with, him, with himself. John 14. Second, Jesus' ascension gives us assurance that our final home will be in heaven with him. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you so. But I go to prepare, when I've told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go, I prepare, so he's, when I go, he's gone, done gone, okay? And I'm preparing a place for you. I will come again, I'll take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. John 14. And remember, all those things in the teens of John are just before he died. So a lot of them have great implication for his death and, and what it means to us. Jesus was a man like us in every way, yet without sin. And he has gone before us so that eventually we might follow him there and live with him forever. The fact that Jesus has already ascended to heaven and achieved the goal set before him gives great assurance to us that we will eventually go there also. Third, and see all these are because of our union, because of our union, because of our union with him. Because of our union with Christ and his ascension, we're able to share now, in part, in Christ's authority over the universe. And we will later share in it more fully. This is what Paul points to when he says that God raised us up with him and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in Ephesians 2.6. We're not physically present in heaven, of course, for we remain here on earth at the present time. But if Christ's session at the right hand refers to his reception of authority, then in fact, then the fact that God has made us sit with Christ means that we share in some measure in the authority that Christ has, authority to contend against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places in the Ephesians 6 armor passage. So he's linking our spiritual battle armor with the fact that we share with him some of the authority. Of course, all of our authority is vested authority from him not authority of our own. Uh, and we do battle with weapons that have divine power to strong, strong, destroy strongholds. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.4 This sharing in Christ's authority over the universe will be made more fully our possession in the age to come. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? 1 Corinthians 6.3 So in the future we've got a lot of stuff because we are co-heirs with Christ. Moreover, we will share with Christ in his authority of the creation that God has made. It says so in Hebrews 2. God promises, Jesus promises, He who conquers and keeps my words until the end, I will give him power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received power from my Father. Revelation, the middle of Revelation 2. He also promises, he who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Revelation 3.21. These are amazing promises of our future, sharing in Christ sitting at the right hand of God, promises that we will not fully understand until the age to come. And we're not going to read the last paragraph. Wow. Woohoo! This is that therefore. I hope you're going, yes, yes, yes. That's why he said, that's why the resurrection is so important. Therefore, live with that yes. Yes, yes. Eternity is all that matters. We're just one breath away from this being reality and our being in his presence. Let's quit living like we belong here. You know, all those, you're aliens and strangers. This is telling us. And then one day, it'll be the yet. It'll be past. It'll really happen. Any questions on all of this?
You didn't know that about the Ascension, did you? Look what we've studied. Wow. Let's pray. We just to give you glory. What else can we say? Glory and honor and praise and majesty and dominion and honor and strength all be to you, Jesus. We do it so incompletely here. Please change our hearts so we spend more time praising you and honoring you for what we've talked about an entire semester that you have done for us. And please let us be emboldened to live the therefore that like there's a line in the sand drawn in our lives that we choose to live with our eyes fixed on the heavenlies and have eternity in our sights and we shake loose of the stupid stuff that we keep living in our hearts rather than look to eternity. We give you glory and praise and thank you. Thank you for the study. Thank you for who you are and all that you've done. And we give you that glory. Amen.